Well, anybody excited about what God's going to do in 2023? Yeah. Of course, at the beginning of the year is always a, a time where uh, we kind of like to have a fresh start, right? Uh, that's why people usually create New Year's resolutions at the beginning of the year. In fact, anybody have any New Year's resolutions around here? Amen. A couple of you guys do. I guess a lot of y'all don't, huh? All right. Well, just keep on doing what you're doing. But, you know, um, often when we do things like set New Year's resolutions, we are really aiming to become the people that we want to be, right? And have the results that we want to have in our lives. And there is a very specific result that God has shared with us at FX Church that he wants us to have in our lives. And that is that this year would be a year of refreshing. Anybody excited about that? God wants it to be a year of refreshing. In fact, I want to just take it through a couple of scriptures that we looked at when we talked about this at the end of the year last year. And so go up and if you were to Acts chapter 3 for a moment. Of course, we'll put this on the screen for you as well. But Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So times of refreshing, notice here, come from the presence of the Lord. One translation says, of course, that it, these are times of recovering from the effects of heat, of reviving with fresh air. And so a lot of us, we've been going through some heat. We would say when we look at 2022, 2021, surely 2020, the heat was on. And God is saying, yeah, I understand that, but I'm actually interested now in bringing you out of that time of heat and bring you into a time of refreshing. I want to refresh you now. I want to revive you now. I want to get you to a place where you're enjoying life like I want you to enjoy life. In fact, Psalm 66 and verse 12 says, Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Anybody went through some fire and some water in the last couple of years? But thou brought us out into a wealthy place. The Amplified Bible says a place of abundance and refreshment and open air. And if you look up that phrase wealthy in the original Hebrew, because the Old Testament is translated from Hebrew, you'll find it means a moist place, a place of satisfaction. God wants you satisfied this year. I'm going to say that again. I said God wants you satisfied this year. God wants you to, to feel like you did on Thanksgiving Day after you finished eating everything that was in the house. You sit back and go, ah, oh, I can't eat another thing. Come on, that's what God wants you to experience. He wants this to be a year of refreshing for you, a year where you're walking into the wealthy place, the place of satisfaction that God has for you. And so, of course, we walked through some things, and we talked about the fact that that means there'll be some new blessings this year. Anybody believe for some new blessings? Amen. We're going to experience some new blessings this year. Some of the things we've been longing for for a long time, we're about to see them in our lives. We learned we're going to have some new relationships this year. Some of y'all going to fall in love this year. I thought at least one or two single people would say amen to that. Come on now. And some of you are going to find that you're going to have a relationship with a brother or sister in Christ, a friend that you've been waiting for your whole life. And then we said we're going to have some new experiences this year. You're going to get closer to God than you've ever been before. We're going to see some moves of God that we haven't seen in a long time in the body of Christ, nationwide and worldwide. This is our year. And, you know, when God gives words like that, you know, a prophecy, as, as many would call it, uh, as I said when we preach this, he, he often will give a piece to one minister, another piece to another minister, another piece to another minister, and you can get a picture for what God has planned for the year. And so I started looking around to see, okay, I know what God said to me. What did he say to others? And I, I found that God was saying, for example, to Brother Copeland that 2023 will be as good as it can be. I thought that was pretty good. I claim that. Or with Bishop Butler, it'll be a year of the blessing. And of course, the blessing brings refreshment. Came across another prophet of God, and I had to write out what he said. He talked about this year being a year of refreshing, and, and, and really, he, he said a number of things that I won't even try to get into. But what really jumped out at me was, was the things that were consistent with what we were saying, where he said that there's coming an hour where you will say, we remember when. 
and you'll be speaking of the harsh season that God is bringing you out of and God is bringing you through. You know what that means? That means the season is over. Then he came back and said, I will bring a rest and a peace to the harshness of the season that you've been in. So we're about to enter into a time of rest. We're about to enter into a time of peace. In fact, I'm wrong to say we're about to enter into it. We're sitting in it right now, a year of refreshing. But of course, for us to experience that like God wants us to, uh, we do need to do our part. We do need to do what we're thinking when we say, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to come up with a list of New Year's resolutions. We need to become the best me that we can be, right? And so we're going to start a series today to help you be the best me that you can be, to help set you up for the year that God wants you to have. And we're calling that series, Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror. And so I want to go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And let's, let's dive into this because I, I really believe as I was studying this, I was thinking, well, Lord, you know, this is not the deepest topic, you know, this is not the most exciting thing. And, and yet he helped me to see that, no, but this is what we need. And that this will bring the exciting things. Because when it's all said and done, what happens in your life is really up to you. I thank you for that one amen. I said, what happens in your life is up to you. Let, let me prove that to you. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Of course, now here in Acts chapter 20, Paul has actually called all the elders of the church to uh, basically a meeting where he's saying goodbye to them. He said, I'm never going to see you again. And he says to them, now I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'm right before God. I taught you what I was supposed to teach you. I was the example I was supposed to be to you. Now it's up to you as leaders of the church. And so then in verse 28, he says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Let me just stop right there because, you know, Paul's talking about ministry. He's talking about how I ministered to you and now it's your job to minister to the people I've given you. But he doesn't then say, now take heed to the people I've, God has called you to minister to. Make sure you do a good job of taking care of your church. The first thing he says is, take heed to yourself. And help you understand what that means, the word take heed simply means pay attention to. So he's saying, first of all, pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to your state. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we see something very similar. Paul is speaking to one minister there by the name of Timothy. And he's saying to him in verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So pay attention to yourself and make sure you're teaching the right things to the people. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So here we go again, another scripture where Paul is saying even to ministers, the first person that you need to make sure is healthy, the first person that you need to make sure is good is you. The first thing you need to do, minister, is pull out your mirror every day and look at yourself. You need to look in the mirror. Somebody say, look in the mirror. That's a good looking guy right there, right? No. You need to look in the mirror. That's what he's saying. He's saying that you got to make sure that your spirit, that's the, the real you, the inside of you, your soul, that's your mind, your will, and your emotions, even your body is, is where it's supposed to be. That you're right, that you're healthy in those ways. Because for them to even be effective pastors, they first had to focus on their own health and their own lifestyle. And if that's true of the most mature in the church, right? These were the elders of the church. They're the most spiritually mature ones. They're the creme de la creme. If it was true of them that they needed to look at themselves before they bothered to look at anybody else, that they needed to look in the mirror before they looked at the world, well then it must be true for everybody else in the body of Christ and for everybody else in the world. That we need to develop the habit of looking in the mirror first before we look at others. Look at Matthew chapter 7. 
Do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Verse 3, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see the past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. I mean, oh, Jesus would just say it as it is. First, somebody say first. Get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Saying first. God's telling us today, focus on yourself first. This morning, when you got up and you brushed your teeth and, and you, you know, used some mouthwash and you washed your face, at least I'm hoping that you did those things. You know, really the first thing you did was look at yourself in the mirror, right? Make sure your hair looks good. Make sure there wasn't, you know, toothpaste coming out the side of your mouth. Come on, you didn't have sleep in the corners of your eye. You looked at you before you start looking at other people. You looked in the mirror and made sure you, you like your fit before you start talking about somebody else's fit. Hopefully you weren't talking about them in a bad way. But right, that, that's, that's how we think. When you get on an airplane and they're walking you through all of the, the safety instructions, they say if the airplane were to lose pressure, there are going to be some mass that drop down. And they say the first thing you need to do, even if you're a parent, is put the mask on yourself first and then on your child. Because if you try to put on the child first, you may not make it and you both die. So you got to look at yourself, make sure you're taken care of before you can even bother to try to take care of even a small child. And so we're seeing a pattern here in Scripture, and that is that we need to look at in the mirror before we look at others. We need to look in the mirror and evaluate ourselves before we evaluate others. In fact, I'll throw one more scripture here to prove it to you in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. And this is actually talking about when somebody who is a believer really just falls away from God. Man, they get caught up in some kind of sin. Maybe they get addicted or they get into adultery or, you know, they end up make, committing a crime and going to prison. And, and Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, should set him right and restore and reinstate him without any sense of superiority. That's big right there. And with all gentleness, notice this, keeping an attentive eye on who? On yourself, lest you should be tempted also. So even here, when he's talking about addressing someone else's sin, trying to help them to, to get back on their feet, he's saying, hey, hey, keep an eye on yourself. Make sure that you're looking in the mirror. Like when you're driving, you're supposed to look forward, but you still got to look in the mirror sometimes, right? You got to look behind you. You got to look in the side view mirrors. He's saying, even then, you still got to have your mirror out. You can kind of make sure that while you're helping them, you, you look at yourself, make sure I'm not falling into the same trap. So we can see here, based on just a number of scriptures, get, that God expects us to look in the mirror from time to time, to focus on ourselves and our own health, our own, 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 own state of being, rather than just focusing on everybody else. Somebody said again, look in the mirror. Put in the comments online, look in the mirror. Well, let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. I love how the message translation says, no one makes a fool of God. I just want you to notice here that this is a warning from heaven. And what God is telling you to, to do is to not let Satan, his enemy, your enemy, deceive you about this topic. Deceive you into thinking that whatever you're doing right now, whatever you do in the future that is wrong, you can get away with it. Because Satan will whisper in your ear, nobody will ever know. You can get away with that. And you start to think that, hey, my actions don't produce reactions. My deeds don't produce results. And so here he's telling you, don't be deceived, man. Don't, don't, don't buy into that. And he's telling you, honestly, you determine if you're going to be deceived. So you, you, you're the one that decides if you're going to do that. And his, his, all, his main point here is this. You shouldn't be deceived because God is not deceived. 
God keeps good records. God keeps good books. What do you mean by that? Notice the next thing he says. For whatever, somebody say whatever. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Whatever he sows, he will reap. Now, of course, the word sow makes you think about a farmer and putting some seed into the ground. And, and he, but he's not talking about that in a natural way, in a worldly way. He's talking about your actions are seeds. Another way of saying that is your deeds are seeds. Turn to him and tell him your deeds are seeds. Say your deeds are seeds. Whatever you do, every action you take is a seed that you're placing into the ground of your life. And the thing about seed is that it is designed to multiply. It is designed to become a harvest. When you put a seed into the ground, you're going to see that seed again with a, with a lot more seed. So it's telling you here that whatever your actions are, you're going to see the results of those actions. Your deeds are seeds. We've also heard things like cause and effect. It's whatever you do is going to bring about an effect. You put a ripple, uh, you drop a stone in the pond and there will be ripples. Action and reaction. Does this all sound familiar? Yeah. Right? And really the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 8, this is how the whole world runs. As long as the earth remains, it says, seed time and harvest will not cease. You are a result of seed time and harvest. I don't have to break down how that happened to a bunch of adults. But you are. You started as a seed. Right? A lot of the, some of the food we eat, that we're, at least we're supposed to eat, is a result of seed time and harvest. For many of you, the money you're making on your job is a result of seed time and harvest. The seed time was school, getting an education, and now you're reaping a harvest of that for the rest of your life. That's how everything in this world is run by seed time and harvest, and that applies to our actions as well, whether they're good actions or bad actions. In fact, you don't have verse 8, but I'll read it to you when he says there, he who sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption or destruction. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So if you sow to the flesh, and if you want to get deeper with it, you can just back up the Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 5, and he talks about the works of the flesh, right? Fornication, adultery, drama, right? Jealousy, uh, fighting, all that stuff that we know we really shouldn't be doing. He said when you're constantly doing those things, you're going to reap the return of destruction in your life. It's going to ruin things. But if you sow to the Spirit, and it talks there in Galatians 5 about sowing love and joy and peace and long-suffering, all those good things, that, then you're going to reap the, re the rewards of that in your life. So notice this, this principle that God's trying to get across to us. In fact, let me show you a couple more, couple more scriptures. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. It says, if you, if you are willing and obedient, that's your seed, you shall eat the good or really that means the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. So based on the seed you sow, you can either eat the best of the land or be devoured by the sword. Your seed is determining your harvest. When you sow the wrong kind of seed, you get the results that Hosea 8 chapter, chapter 8 says, for they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. He's talking about a group of people that have done wrong, and God said, payday is coming. They've sown the wind, and they're going to reap the whirlwind. So notice what God is showing us here. Notice that Galatians 6 doesn't say, whatever the devil sows in your life, you'll reap. Galatians doesn't say, whatever others sowed in your life, you will reap. Now, we recognize that, that other people play a role in the state that we may be in right now to some degree, but even then, when, when others have caused some of the suffering that we've had, when it's all said and done, they're not the ones that are going to determine your outcome. You are. 
In fact, do me a favor. If you happen to have a, 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 a smartphone, take it out right now. Take out your smartphone. If you don't, then you know somebody can, can do this with you. Take it out. I want you to take a selfie in church. Everybody, take a selfie. Can we do that? Pull your phone out. Can we take my phone out in church? Yes. Take your phone out. Take a selfie. Y'all act like I don't ever take You lie. You took five selfies coming to church today. Come on now. Take a, take a selfie right now. I'm going to take a selfie in church of myself. Can y'all take a selfie? I'm taking a selfie. I got a smile. Somebody next to you don't have a phone. Take your selfie with them. Make it a selfie. So I don't know. All right, we got some selfies going on. All right, take a moment. Look at your selfie. Look at the person in the picture. That person is the person who's played a major role in creating the world, the situations, the problems, and the financial reality that you're dealing with in your life right now. That person. How some people feel about you is a result of that person. What your future's gonna look like is up to that person. Yeah, but the black man, the white man, the Republican, the Democrat, the, that person. But my, my daddy, my mama, my boss, my teacher, my, that person. But you don't know what happened in my past, that person. Whatever this person sows, there's per, this person's going to reap. couple quotes. <laughs> David Crank said this, he says, what happens in your life is not based on the economy. It's not based on the Democrats or Republicans or any other current events. It is based on your decisions. What decision do you need to make today? Kenneth Copeland says this, you are the captain of your ship. You have control over your own life, your spirit, your soul, and your body because Jesus has delegated power over Satan to you as a believer. Dave Ramsey says, you are not a victim. You may have been a victim of something, but sitting here today looking forward, you get to decide what you will tolerate in your life. Kobe Bryant said this, the only person that can stop you from accomplishing something is yourself. Because whatever you sow, you will reap. So the question to ask yourself as we begin 2023 is what kind of seed are you going to sow? Because that's going to tell you what kind of year you're going to have. And one way we sow seed is through our words. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So your words are seeds too. And there's a lot of scripture that shows that. So speaking your words, it, it, the words that you're speaking will become a harvest in your future. So if you keep saying the wrong things about yourself, you keep saying the wrong things about your family, about your health, about your money, about your city, about your country, you keep saying the wrong things, eventually you're going to believe those things. And when you believe what you say, it will be the harvest that you're saying. You will have what you say. Somebody else said this. They said, Satan can't curse you, but he understands that life and death are in the power of your tongue. So his entri entire strategy is to get you to curse yourself. Because he knows that not only are your deeds seeds, but your words are seeds. See, the reason why God tells us to pay attention to ourselves is because the outcomes of our lives are the are direct result of our heart's condition and our actions. You're the one constant in your life. Anybody ever had that moment where you feel like, man, I need a vacation from me? Anybody ever had that? I've had a couple of those moments. I just, can I just get a break from Andre? Can I just get away from, can't get away from this guy? 
You're the one constant in your life. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter who you're with. You're ultimately responsible for the outcome of your life. And that's why it's so important that you develop the habit of looking in the mirror. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Now this is actually talking about what many call the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. And, uh, and of course what Paul is talking to this church about is he's saying that before you partake of Holy Communion, examine your heart to make sure you are properly reverencing it. This is the whole point, was that this represents the body and blood of Jesus, and if you take this without the proper reverence, you'll find that it'll actually bring harm into your life. And so stop and examine yourself first. Make sure your heart is right. Make sure you're approaching this with proper reverence before you do it. That was his whole point. But we can see based on the scriptures we've already looked at, that the principle applies to our lives as a whole. That there are times where you need to examine yourself. And the word examine here means to test, to approve. Or I love how it's translated elsewhere in the Bible, to discern. Really look at me and what's going on in my mind, in my heart, and what I'm actually doing. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 4, the Amplified Bible, I think, does an even better job of this. It says, but let every person carefully scrutinize and examine and test his own conduct and his own work. Carefully scrutinize, examine, and test his own conduct. Remember, the goal here in testing is to make sure that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're free of all that is wrong, right? Well, with the Holy Communion, whole, his whole point was make sure you're clean in here before you do this. So if you're not clean in here, you're not approaching this right, make the adjustment, then you can partake of the Lord's table. And really, that's the idea we ought to have in our lives. There are times we ought to stop and examine ourselves and make sure everything is the way I want it to be so I'm ready to go into the world. But when you got up this morning and you, 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 you know, you, you shaved, brothers, or you put your makeup on, ladies, you didn't just do a quick glance. You examined it. You made sure that you didn't miss a spot. You, or you, you made sure it looked the way you, you took some time to, to make sure that I looked the way I want it to look. And God is saying that we really need to do the same things when it comes to who we are, our spirits, our souls, our actions, that we need to examine ourselves, that we need to have the courage and the humility to look in the mirror for real. Somebody say it again, look in the mirror. Turn them and tell them, look in the mirror. God wants us to examine ourselves. And, and that does take humility. Because sometimes we're so full of ourselves we don't see who we really are. Thank you for that one call. It wasn't even an amen, it was just a call. <laughs> Sometimes the Bible says you've got to humble yourself. In fact, there's multiple scriptures. I just didn't want to give you too many today, but there are multiple scriptures that say to not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. to not be high-minded. And we, we struggle with this because, you know, we, we, we kind of get in a ditch, right? When it comes to spiritual things, that's how people are in general and Christians for sure. We get in a, one, in a ditch on one side or the road or the other. So on one side, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm horrible. You know, I, I don't deserve anything. And you know, Father, just give me a cabin in the corner of heaven. And on the other side, I'm everything. I'm the man. I'm the best on the planet. You know, we, we sing his songs. I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm the man. Come on now. You know what I'm trying to say. I'm going way back, but you get the point. Right? And the answer is somewhere in the middle. I'm not some wretch anymore. I'm not singing, you know, you know he saved a wretch like me because I'm not a wretch anymore. 
I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have right standing before him. I'm a son of God. I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, I've got value. God sees me as treasure. All that is true, but it's all true in him. Because of him, not because I'm the man. Not because I'm better than everybody else. No, 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 no. The same thing that's true of me is true of everybody else if they're walking what God has for them. But even understanding that I'm in this position of value means I also understand that there are times where I could miss it. I'm not Jesus yet. I'm trying to be like him. But, but I, my, my, my righteousness is through him. My, 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 my ability is through him. And he has told me, if you as a believer say you do not sin, you are lying. It's First, first John chapter 1. If you say I do not sin, you lie and you do not the truth. That's why God said to us in verse 1 John 1, 9, we can put it on the screen. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all wickedness. And you know, some say that's a scripture that's written to unbelievers and, you know, they look at it as a salvation scripture. It is written to believers. The whole book of 1 John is written to believers. John himself saying, if we, John, had sin, yes. If we confess of our sins, and he says, we have an advocate with the Father. He's our, uh, he's our defense attorney. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So really, humility is based on truth. Pride is based on a lie. And so the truth is, man, God has made me righteous. I am, I, I'm, I'm able to do all things through Christ. Yes, I am valuable to him, but there are times where I miss it. There are times when I'm off. There are times where I need to make some adjustments. And we have to be very careful that we are not like children who cannot accept that I might be wrong. That is an immature position. Because little children do that, right? You got to tell them eight times, did you, no, did you, no, did you, no, did you, no, did you, yes. <laughs> Don't you pull the belt out, right? The immature, immature people can, can't ever say I'm wrong because they don't have enough maturity to be able to look in the mirror and see the truth. And God is saying there are times in your life and it really should be on a regular basis where you examine yourself. What did I just say? Why did I say that? What did I do? And I, this is where you got to go. Not why I did it. What I did. Period. We give, we don't like to give anybody, we, we don't give anybody else the benefit of the doubt but ourselves often. So we get into, yeah, but they did this and they did this and this is how I failed and this is how I failed and this was happening in the world and I was stressed out. It all may be true. But whatever a man sows, not whatever his environment is, he's going to reap from, no, no, no. Whatever a man sows, so people could tell you off and you can actually give the right answer, reaction. You could be as stressed out as tired as can be and still act like Jesus. <gasps> you could have suffered the worst experience, you could have experienced the worst racism you have ever experienced in your life and still find a way to turn the other cheek. <gasps> when it's all said and done, you, there comes a point where you gotta look at your actions and your heart and not make excuses and be able to say, that was wrong and I need to change it. And that's one of the things we're going to have to do if we're going to have a year of refreshing this year is that we've got to learn to examine ourselves. We've got to be willing to, to take responsibility for what those things in our lives that are not what they should be for the things in our character that aren't really where they're supposed to be. 
You know, I was watching a movie the other day, and I've seen it many times. I, I, I really love this movie. It's called The Man in the Iron Mask. Anybody ever seen The Man in the Iron Mask? A couple of y'all haven't been a while, around for a while. And in fact, the one I saw was a remake. And, you know, and, and it was really about uh, a king, and, and I won't get too deep, so I won't ruin it for you, but you had this young king, and, you know, as king, particularly in that type of government, whatever he said went. It didn't matter if it was right or wrong. If he said it, no one could hold him accountable. No one. And a, part, and a big part of the movie was that he was taking that power and abusing it. Because he knew he could say and do whatever he wanted and nobody could do anything to him. And so I actually like to watch movies while I'm lifting weights in my basement, you know, so I'll be lifting and watching something. And, and it occurred to me, I'll say, well, you know what? If you are a king and no one could hold you accountable for your actions, would you be a good king or an evil one? Would there be any accountability in your life? Because in that case, the only person that could hold you accountable would be you. So if nobody could come and arrest you, nobody could come and, you know, correct you, nobody could take your job, nobody could, you know, walk away from you, any of that kind of stuff, and, and you just got what you want, what kind of king would you be? And what we can see from the Word of God is that we ought to be the type of person that would be a good king, that could, would look in the mirror from time to time and say, that was wrong. Let me fix that. Let me correct it. Let me apologize. Let me do these things because, because I can see that's the wrong thing to do. Often when we end up in, in, in difficult situations in life, we like to look at everyone else and everything else. And this is part of what the Holy Spirit was warning us about when he said, do not be deceived. Whatever you sow, you will reap. And so Satan has deceived some of us into looking at everything else, even telling ourselves about the future that, you know, whatever happens to me is a result of A, B, and C. And if they do this, and no, 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 no. It's the person in the mirror. I can speak to this as an African-American man. This is, I believe, a major problem in our culture. The victim mentality. It is a, it's not minor, it is major. You walk down the street and talk to many people about the plight in their life and they always want to blame someone or something whether it's someone, something that happened to them in the last year or something that happened 60 to 100 or 200, 300 years ago. And yet there'll be somebody that came up in the same world that they came up in and they overcame all of that and they're changing the world. Yes. Same things happen to them. But we don't get that. We want to blame somebody instead of recognizing that in this day and age, especially in this day and age in this country, you determine your destiny. Everybody has obstacles. But whether or not you accomplish your goals is up to you. It's up to whether or not you're going to do things you know you're supposed to do, and you're going to let God step in and be a major part of your life and be the one that takes you over the top. You must examine yourself and it's something I told the Lord actually a couple days ago in prayer maybe a couple weeks ago at this point where I said to him I'm gonna look in the mirror I basically said to him I want to be right in every way before him spiritually mentally emotionally in my relationships I just said show me please the adjustments that I need to make it's kind of similar to what David said in the song. Hey man, I'm laying everything before you. I want you to tell me, and he will tell you. Don't pray that prayer if you don't want to know about yourself. Because he will tell you about yourself. 
So I made a decision. I want this year to be the, the year I'm even closer to God than ever, even the last year. And I want to challenge you to do the same thing. So let me give you five areas to look in the mirror about to help you as you examine yourself. Number one, your spiritual habits, your walk with God. Are you close to God or are you far from God? Are you doing the basic things that God said you should do as one of his children if you're a, father, if you're a believer? You read your Bible every day. We're going through a chapter a day. In fact, this month we're doing Proverbs. So if you don't remember what day it is, today is the 8th, we're in Proverbs 8. We got it on our website, we got it on our social media, read a chapter a day. Are you praying every day? Jesus said men ought to pray always. I've often mentioned, and I'll probably come back to this in this series, you know, it's good to start with 15 minutes a day in prayer. But really, as a believer, you should be at an hour a day. You should be. Maybe your first year in Christ, you can get away with 15 years. After that, Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer. An hour is, what do we say, like 5% of your day, 2% of your day, something like that. It's, it's not a high percentage. 15% is it's a very low percentage. Are you doing that? Or at least working your way toward it? It's time to examine yourself. If not, why? What's taking your time? Maybe you should pull out your calendar and look at what's happening in your day and evaluate why I'm not walking with God like I should. What's keeping me from church? What's keeping me from serving? What's keeping me from my group? Examine yourself and your spiritual life, and then make adjustments. Number two, your character, oof. Who you are, what you do. We're gonna spend some time, we're gonna dig deeper on some of these, but I'm just touching the topic right now. What kind of person are you? You operate in love and joy and peace and long suffering and self-control, or are you a monster on wheels? You know, sleeping with everything, drinking everything, smoking everything, telling everything off. <laughs> Defending yourself. I gotta, I can't nobody talk to me like that. Well, who are you? What makes you think that's a mature response? I ain't gonna let nobody talk to me like that. Child? You're acting like a child. Right? That's the immaturity. Somebody gonna talk, there's always somebody that they'll put a gun in your head, you let them talk to you like they wanna talk to you, <laughs> right? Who are you? What's your character? Your character's made up of the, 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 the things you consistently do. Are you a constant liar? Complainer? Now, I'm not saying this to beat you up, but we gonna take some time and just do this. I'm gonna build you back up. Next couple of sins, we're going to get you excited, but we got it. We can't, we can't. What's the point of preaching about something and dancing about something if you're never going to live it because that person is, is still kind of ugly? What's your character? Who are you really? And let me tell you something, single people, one of the best things you can do to prepare for your match, for your bay, is to work on your character. Number three, look in the mirror about your relationships. How are you dealing with people? Most of us, we have some good relationships. We got some relationships. We got some friction in. Okay, well, they may have said this, said that, but look in the mirror. How about what we aren't doing? Do you have a relationship with somebody that doesn't know God, that you're trying to win to Jesus? Because you should, you're supposed to be winning people. Right? You win by being a friend. Who are you connected with right now that you're working on? And if there's no one, that needs to be, there needs to be an adjustment. Let's keep going. Your health. What are you eating? I want to lose so-and-so pounds this year. Okay, have you changed your diet? Are you still eating what you ate last year when you put those pounds on? Y'all love me earlier. Yeah, pastor preacher. Now y'all, get off the stage, preacher. 
I came across something. I, I, I was going to share this with you later, but I came across something. I happened to be looking something up on, and I found, ooh, I'm going here. All right. We got our protection up here. So yeah. I found that the average man and woman in 2022 is the same height as the average man and average woman in 1965. Red, yellow, black, and white. The difference between a man and woman in 1965 and a man and woman in 2022 is 30 pounds. The average man is 30 pounds heavier. The average woman is 30 pounds heavier. And you tell me why that is. What are we eating? Are we exercising? Do you work out? God did not make this body to sit still. Thank you for that one clap. I will pay you later after the service is over. Examine yourself. You don't like what you look like in the mirror? Change it. You can change your entire body in six months. I played college sports. I remember being taught all this stuff. I got my degree. I know you can change it in six months. You can look totally different. The problem is we want to look different in six weeks, six days. We want to eat the same stuff and do the same things and, you know, watch people exercise and run in a movie. <laughs> and, and then they wonder where our health problems come from. And sometimes it's just because you aren't examining yourself. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but I want to help you. I want to say some people's lives. Because it's, when it's all said and done, you're determining what you're eating, you're determining if you're working out, you're determining what's happening when it comes to your health. Yes. Last one, your diligence. Talk about your work life. Here's another thing to examine. You know, this is why I struggle with people who complain about not having money and, you know, well, the poor, you know, this and that and the other. Well, you know, we know there are poor people who are poor because they have been put in a tough situation and they're still working to climb out. But there are a lot of people that are poor or don't have enough because they are lazy. It's just, that is B-I-B-L-E. Proverbs 10.4, he that deals with the slack hand is gonna lack, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Are you spending time consuming or creating? It's very easy to sit down and watch Netflix all day. Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, we're about to do Faith X Network, right? Thank God for all of that. It's easy to pick up a book and read a book written by this author and that author and go to a game and watch somebody else play. And it's all that's great, but what are you creating? There's a time to enjoy those things, don't get me wrong. But that time is supposed to be rest after you have done something. And if you've got a dream in your heart and you've been talking about the same dream for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what's taking you so long? There are people who on January 8th today will be unknown and in 90 days will have a million followers and a millionaire watch happens every year. It'd be a 16 year old kid. Well, they just happen to go viral. You don't happen to go viral. They were diligent. That's just one area. Some of these athletes that we, we look at, we say, man, look at this guy. He's 17, 18, he's 21. Look at what he's done. He didn't just grow and he wasn't just there because he's seven feet. There's a lot of guys that are seven feet that are doing they're, they're at the line at McDonald's checking you out. This guy was diligent. We all have talent. We all have ability. Every person that's a follower of God has the blessing of the Lord available to them. You can rise to the top of whatever industry God has for you, and it might be time to look at, am I working as hard as I'm supposed to be? 
There are times when you have to have a season where you work until you almost feel like you can't work no more, and then later you can kind of back off and enjoy life a little bit. Have you gone through that season yet? Or are you too busy trying to have fun when you should be digging a hole? Man, y'all love this message until about five, ten minutes ago. You got to examine yourself. How diligent am I being? Am I just talking about a dream or am I making it happen? Remembering that the blessing of the Lord caused God to prosper what you put your hand to. What your hands on. Look in the mirror. Somebody say, look in the mirror. mirror. I'm going to end by looking at this scripture, and I don't went 10 minutes over what I expected. So Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know, to help you with this concept, recognize that you're living for an audience of one. If you just get back to the basics, of focusing on pleasing God and your spiritual habits, pleasing God with your character, pleasing God in your relationships, pleasing God when it comes to your health, pleasing God when it comes to your work life, you'll find out that God will be able to take you to the heights that he has always wanted you to go. You'll become the you that you want to be and you'll experience a year of refreshing. So two questions I want to give you as I end this to ask yourself. Are you happy with your life? And is God happy with you? And if the answer to either one of them is no, examine yourself, make some adjustments, let God transform you and begin, get ready to experience the best season of your life. Come on, let's, let's lift our hands and give God praise and glory. Thank you, Father, for the word of God. Thank you for getting our attention today. Stuffing the mirror in our face and saying, hey, look, there's some work you need to do. If you can agree with this, go ahead and agree with this. Father, we commit ourselves today to looking in the mirror. We want to be the people you made us to be. We want to be right before you, pleasing you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, in our relationships, physically, in our career. We commit ourselves today to doing just that, to being who you called us to be. Show us, as we go throughout this week and and in this series, the adjustments we need to make, Father. And when you show it to us, We'll make them. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody agree with that? Anybody thank, thankful for that? Thank you, Father. For what we are about to become, what we're about to experience. And now every head bowed, everybody closed in prayer. There may be someone that would say, the adjustment I need to make is that I need to actually choose to follow Jesus, to follow God. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 that to preach the gospel to every creature, the good news about him, right? And then he said, he that believeth will be saved. And he that believeth not will be damned. If you are someone that has never been the he that believeth, I want to encourage you to make the greatest decision of your life. You got a bit of a tug of war going on in your heart. That's God pulling on you saying, come be a part of my family. I'm what you've been looking for. And so if you're ready to say yes to him today, we want to help you do just that. Someone else may say, I made a decision to follow Jesus, but somewhere along the line, I just got away from God. The world says you got to clean yourself up and then you can come to God, but that's not how God works. God helps you to do the things we just finished talking about. But that begins with you coming to him. And if you've gotten away from him, he wants you to come home to him. If you're ready to do that this new year, we want to help you with that today as well. And so I've given two very simple invitations. The first, to choose to believe in Jesus, to follow him, to give God your life like he gave you his. The second, to get right with him or come home to him. 
If either one of those invitations apply to you today, if you want to say yes to God concerning either one of those areas, I want to encourage you right now, wherever you are, to be bold and just lift up your hand. Go ahead, lift your hand right now if I'm talking about you. I see that hand. I see that hand as well. I see that hand. If you're online somewhere, lift your hand because it's not really about me seeing it. It's about God seeing it. You're letting him know, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to become a part of your family. I'm ready to get right with you. Lift your hand right now. Let's start this new year, this year of refreshing the right way. And if you raise your hand, or you know that you should have raised your hand, and there's probably something that have a battle going on in, in your hearts, and if that's you, just go for it. Try God, watch what God does in your life. But if you raise your hand, or you know that you should have raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer with me from your heart. I'm gonna ask everybody to pray it with you as well. So repeat after me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today to give you my life. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. I repent of sin. I'm sorry, Lord. I turn away from it and I receive you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer, for answering my prayer, and for saving me now. And Father, we thank you for those that have prayed this prayer for the first time and for anyone else that have chosen to come home to you. We ask, Father, that you help us to know you more and more, to know the benefits you provided for us, how valuable we are to you, and the great power you've made available to us. We ask that your power work in our lives, helping us to win in whatever situations we're facing. And we give you the praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give a round of applause to those that made that decision today. Great, great decisions. I hope that helped you. God has an amazing future for you, one that is greater than anything you can create for yourself. But the way to get to that future is to do things God's way, to actually apply what you just heard. So I want to encourage you to do just that. And also I want to encourage you to join us on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. as our FX Nation family comes together. Be a part of FX Nation and watch God take you to heights you've never experienced before. And if you're someone that's saying, well, I'm already a part of a church somewhere, but I feel connected to your ministry, well, you sound like a partner to me. And I encourage you to go to andrebutler.com and sign up there and help us get this message about the future that God has for you all throughout the world. Now, if it happens to be on your heart to be a blessing to this ministry, you can do that. You can go to MyFaithX.com or you can download the Faith Experience app and you can give there and find a bunch more messages. But even if you're not ready to give, I want you to know that we love you. We're thanking God for the opportunity to be a blessing to you. And we know that God has an amazing future for you. I'll see you soon.